Matthew chapter 25, if you would, please. Because of the nature of this parable, this is about as far as we're going to get this morning. And you'll see why. And just, in fact, you already know why, because you have the outline of the message in your bulletin, and you have some suggested questions we might discuss afterwards. Paul is going to lead a discussion group in the fellowship hall immediately after we dismiss him here and keep the study going. Now the little multiple choice thing in there is just to spark your thoughts, clarify your thinking, to get you thinking, what more could I study about this parable to gain insight into the whole entire Olivet Discourse. As you know, Jesus is answering the question his disciples put forth to him. It had three parts. The latter part was, what will be the sign of your coming? And he's answering that question. And this is just one of four parables that he's using to answer that very important question. This all goes back to Verses 31 and 32, which we talked about last week. That, well, I'll just read it. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. This parable is like the others in the sense it's saying judgment is coming. So at the end of this chapter, Jesus clarifies what this is all about. This is just one segment of that entire message. The parable of the fig tree, which we discussed last week, reveals that the generation that sees the happening of that parable will be alive when he comes back. So you need to figure out if you're in that generation or not. The second parable, the two servants, reveals how evil men will be and how surprised they will be when Jesus comes back. Chapter 24, verse 50. He will come at an hour when he is unaware. So don't be concerned about all the evil people in this world. You, because, you put your focus on Jesus. He'll deal with those when the time is right. The one we're going to talk about today, these ten maidens, is how some will not be ready when he comes back. The parable of the talents reveals how some will waste their gift. In this little church family, we talk about this one a lot. We want everybody who wants to to have a ministry that God has led them to perform. Some of you do it next door with our Sunday school, and I am very thankful for you because some of the kids over there are my grandkids. Actually, great-grandkids. And I'm delighted that you're over there on a regular basis instructing them on the Word of God and how they need to follow Jesus starting at their age. Now, with that short introduction, this parable. Now, I'm going to indulge your grace for just a moment. On the back, you'll see I've defined the, gr the Greek word translated virgin. That's the last time I'm going to say that word. The literal translation is maiden, a young girl suitable for marriage. In that culture, that would be a maiden. Since these ten ladies are part of a wedding, I'm going to refer to them as bridesmaids. Now, they're not called bridesmaids in the parable. However, that's how we're going to do it. But first, we're going to read exactly what... Jesus said, recorded in Matthew chapter 25, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. 
Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with, in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And afterwards, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open the, to us. But he answered and said, As surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you need know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Verse 13 is the whole point of the parable. That's the point of the entire story right there. In fact, that's the point of just about every parable that Jesus used to give an indication of what were the signs of his time will come. In this story... Some were ready and some were not. There will be a judgment day. And we don't know when he's coming back. But as we read at the end of the chapter, in the beginning, when he comes, he's going to separate those who are saved from those who are not saved. The sheep from the goats. This parable is about that day. The foolish did not prepare themselves for judgment. They did not come to the invitation to the wedding feast ready. We just found out why they weren't ready. They had no oil. So let's make a few observations. There are ten bridesmaids. Five wise, five foolish. Is God suggesting that half the population, the population of the earth will be ready and half will not? No. He's just saying in this parable, many, half, were unprepared. Is this suggesting there will be a large number of people not ready for Jesus' second coming? Yes. That's going to be the question I'm going to ask you in just a few minutes. Are you ready for his return? What if he interrupts me right in the middle of this and boom, shows up? Are you ready? So don't wait till I shut up. Get ready now while I'm still talking. <laughs> Secondly, the wise bridesmaids had oil in their lamps. The foolish ones brought no oil. That's what it says. The five foolish went out to buy oil. Now why the wise ones suggested they go do that, I have no answer to that question. But they bought that. So while they're out there knocking on doors at midnight or thereabouts, looking for oil, the groom arrives. They come back later. It doesn't say they came back later with oil. It just says they came back. And they're wanting to get in. And Jesus says, I do not know you. And that's the phrase I do not want anybody in this room to hear when you're standing for Jesus. Depart from me. I, I don't know you. That's critical. Some who claim to know Jesus are not known by him. The second one is the more important. You can know all about Jesus. You can quote verses. You can turn quickly to your Bible to countless passages that talk about Jesus as the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, and everything having to do with him and still not personally know him. And that's the purpose of the parable. Do you know him? Are you indwelt by his spirit? If you are, then you're ready. 
The bridesmaids represent those waiting for the groom. Isn't that what we just read? They're waiting for the announcement that the groom is coming for those who have been invited to the feast. In a traditional Jewish wedding, which plays into this, there are three steps. The first one is when the father of the bride and the father of the groom negotiate the giving of the daughter to the son. Ladies, aren't you glad we don't do that anymore? Well, your dad sits down with you, the guy that you would like to marry, and he goes, well, let's talk about this. <laughs> In that negotiation, a dowry is set where the father of the groom on behalf of his son pays a dowry to the father of the bride for the, does he buy her? No, there's a exchange of something valuable to cement this agreement that the two families agree that these can marry and become one flesh. The second step is a betrothal. Remember the story of Joseph and Mary, they were betrothed. Now in their culture, that was a whole lot more than a simple engagement. To break a betrothal, that meant getting divorce, a certificate of divorce. That's how serious a betrothal was. You were married, but you had not consummated the marriage yet. The vows had not been exchanged yet. But you were man and wife as far as the families were concerned. The third and final step was the marriage, and more importantly, the wedding feast. To all you dads of unmarried daughters, their wedding feast went on for days. <laughs> Not a couple hours where money just floats out of your wallet. <laughs> Tens and twenties and hundreds and blah, blah, blah. Now some of that's fun. I remember my daughter got married. I had a blast. Was it expensive? Yes. Was it worth every penny? Absolutely. To be able to walk her down the aisle and hand her over to Steve, my son-in-law, was a wonderful event. As you know, Marsh and I just got to go to a wedding in Washington where one of our granddaughters got walked down the aisle by one of our sons. Did we cry? Of course we did. It's a wonderful thing. But how we do it now is not how they did it then. So these bridesmaids are waiting for the groom to come and bring them to the feast. Now what I want you to notice when you read it again, the bride is not mentioned in the parable. It does not say that the groom came with his bride and got the ten. It just says the groom is coming. The bride is not mentioned at all. So where is she? Is she already gone? Has she already been taken by the groom to the place where he's prepared, which was part of the culture? And by the way, it was the dad of the groom who told the son when the preparations were done. Isn't that a coincidence? It is Father God who knows when the son will return for his bride. So when the dad approved for all the preparations, then the son was given permission to go get his bride and bring her to her new home. She's not mentioned in here. Now we have to get into all the symbols, and that's going to be continued in the discussion afterwards. So the ten bridesmaids are waiting. The oil, let me back up. I think the bridesmaids represent all who are waiting for the return of Jesus. Everyone who is lo looking toward the second coming, are represented by these two, ten ladies. The oil can represent several things depending on how you look at it. In the Bible, oil has often been related to anointing. If you go all the way back into the Old Testament, you'll see over and over again how oil, olive oil, is used as part of the process of anointing people, 
places and things to make them holy, suitable for worship. The ceremony to anoint Aaron and his sons as the first high priest took seven days. After that, all the implements, the tabernacle and all the furniture for worship was anointed by oil after sacrifices had been made to make everything holy. Why? It was the tabernacle where God would sit with his people on the mercy seat, the Ark of Testimony, the Ark of Covenant. It was a very holy place. In fact, it even had a most holy place. So oil was used for that over and over again. Now Luke records a time when Jesus mentions that. Luke chapter 4. Hold your place in chapter 25 of Matthew if you want to turn there. But Jesus is invited to read the scroll from the scriptures at his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. So he came to Nazareth, verse 16, chapter 4, Luke, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Let me pause. Jesus did not choose Isaiah. It was the portion of scripture scheduled to be read that Sabbath. He didn't flip through the scrolls and decide, I'll read chapter 61 of the book of Isaiah. For two reasons, that wasn't the custom. And the other reason is there was no chapter 61. The Bible had not been numbered yet. Let me continue. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to <coughs> and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. All the eyes of all were on him in the synagogue, fixed on him. And he began to say, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, if you compare that to Isaiah 61, you'll see that Jesus stopped in mid-sentence. This is why they were glaring at him. Why did you stop? Well, he just explained to you and them why he stopped. That scripture that he read had been fulfilled in their hearing. Notice the word anointing, healing, giving sight to the brokenhearted and the blind, to sinners. That's why he came. In scripture, oil is used often for healing. James says to the church, if anyone is ill in the church, let him come to the elders of the church, ask them to pray and anoint with oil. We do that here. We use olive oil, the same kind of oil you have in your kitchen, I'm sure. There's nothing miraculous about that oil. We don't go to a certain store and buy miracle oil. <laughs> Why? That's not how it's done. There's nothing miraculous in the oil. What's the miracle? God the Father answering the prayer according to obedient children. That's why we do it. Oil is often used to represent the Holy Spirit who gives light into this dark world. In this tabernacle, and there's a photo of one in the fellowship hall, when you read how it was built, it was pitch black dark in there, in the actual building within the curtained wall. Because of the style of the roof, it had five layers on it. When the curtain was closed at the only way in and out, it would be 
pitch black in there. The only light came from the menorah, the seven-lamped lampstand. And when it was lit and kept lit, that was the only oil light in there. What did it reveal? The table of showbread. So the oil provided light to reveal Jesus, the bread of life. What else would you see? The pedestal where the incense was kept burning, representing the prayers of the saints, according to Paul in the New Testament. That's what you would see. Behind the curtain that was stood the Ark of Testimony, the Ark of Covenant. No one could go in there except the high priest and only one day out of the year on the Day of Atonement. That would be dark. So the light in there was the burning of the oil. Therefore, many of you and students of Scripture liken the oil in this parable to the Holy Spirit. Some had oil in their lamps. Some did not. Some had the Spirit. Some did not. In John chapter 3, when you're born of the Spirit, you have new life. I think that's part of the interpretation of this parable. Those who have been born of the Spirit and of water enter the kingdom of heaven, and that's what this is all about. There's an incident that happened in the ministry of the apostles recorded in Acts chapter 8 by Luke where a gentleman saw the miraculous powers of some of the apostles. His name was Simon. He was so taken by that, he asked if he could buy it. That's part of the interpretation of this parable. Did they sell it to him? No. They sent him on his way. You can't buy this. You cannot buy the Holy Spirit. It is a gift of life which comes through grace and faith. So why these foolish ladies thought they could go out in the dead of night and buy it means they were ill-informed on what the Torah the prophets actually said because they didn't have the New Testament yet. I'm going to submit for your consideration that since the bride is not mentioned in this parable, that this is not about the rapture. Jesus is not giving a parable about you're all going to be waiting for me to come back and half of you will be ready to go with me when I come get my church and half of you will not. I don't think he's talking about that at all. I think the church is already gone. So he's talking about a time that comes after the rapture of the church, which would put it in my thinking of studying Revelation during the tribulation period. So these ladies could be those who come to faith during the preaching of the 144,000 and others who have been left behind and went, oops. I better get on my knees and ask God to forgive me, and they do. And so because of that, these ten ladies represent that group. Well, why is it that some of them had the Holy Spirit and some didn't? Let me offer two possible reasons. One, in the book of Revelation, there is no verse that says that those who believe were given the indwelling of the Holy Spirit not there. Instead, there are given commandments to obey all the commandments of God. Sound familiar? Sounds Old Testament, doesn't it? Reason number two, possibly, it hurts me to say this, that many who go to churches even today are not really born again. They have just gotten in the habit of going to church. 
listening to an old white-haired guy talk, <laughs> accept an invitation to go to lunch afterwards, or sit around in a discussion group and go, yeah, amen, yeah, yeah, amen. But they have never, ever said to God, I believe. They just kind of followed the crowd like sheep, and some are being led astray by wolves in sheep's clothing to think they're born again when they are not born again. Only those born of the Spirit are of the Spirit. It says so in the Gospels. The Holy Spirit is given as a seal, as a guarantee of our inheritance in Christ. It is not given, he is not given to those who just say, I believe. This is why I'm not a fan of altar calls. If you've been here any time at all, you realize I don't do that. I don't ask those who want to be saved today to come forward, get on their knees, and let me put my hands on them and pray for them or ask them questions. I don't even do it while they're sitting out there. Why don't you close your eyes, bow your heads, and we'll pray this prayer. And then when you get up and go, well... You're saved. I don't have that power. No man does. Salvation is between you and God. Warning. You cannot lie to God. Only those who from the heart confess to God what they believe, Romans chapter 10, are saved. Only those, only those are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's one of the points of the parable. I submit for your consideration that five of these young ladies had mouthed the words, possibly, got caught up in a wedding feast, maybe, and they thought they were going when they were not going. And they heard those dreadful words, go away, I don't know you. I don't want that to be you. If you're not certain, stop listening to me and start talking to God. So when you walk out of here this morning, you know that you know that you're in him and he's in you. Otherwise, when he comes back, you're going to get left behind. And when he shuts the door, it's going to be on your face. And don't expect him to come knocking. Behold, I stand at the door to knock. You open the door. That's not going to be the case. When judgment comes, it is too late. Therefore, I think that these five foolish bridesmaids showed up for the wedding feast with no oil at all. I think that's what it says in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 25. Let me turn back there because now I'm in Luke. Those who were foolish, verse 3, took their lamps and took no oil. They didn't even have oil in their lamps. So what does it mean that they trimmed their lamps? We can talk about it later, but I'm going to suggest they lit the wick. It burned until it burned out. No oil, no light. They're standing in darkness. This, unfortunately, describes a lot of people who think they're Christians. They're functioning in their own power. Their light is their own, dare I say it, deception. They have fallen prey to somebody who said sometime in their past, you say these words and you're a believer. You're a Christian. You let me baptize you and it is a done deal. You join my church and start tithing and I'll guarantee it. <laughs> Don't buy that lie. God is sovereign. He is holy. He is just. He is full of grace and mercy. But there's going to come a time. His grace, he, his grace will not run out. His mercy will not disappear. 
but the day of judgment arrives. And on the great white throne judgment described in the book of Revelation, Jesus is going to sit and judge the nations. And he'll open the book of life. And those names are not in there. They go in the pit. It says so. Judgment is coming. If you know somebody and you think that they're deceiving themselves, talk to them this week. We don't know when he's coming back. Get a hold of them. Open the Bible. Show them in Scripture what they need to do. And what they need to do is have a personal heart-to-heart -heart talk with God the Father about his Son Jesus Christ so that the Holy Spirit the third part of this wonderful trinity can be sent as a comforter a helper a paraclete in the Greek to guide them before you go before you make the phone call to set up the appointment and please talk to them eye to eye so we've lost that. We have lost that. We get so busy texting and emailing. And all. We have lost the, the, this communication where we're looking at somebody and looking in their eyes and we're seeing they get it. Here's the selfish reason I want you to do it in person. When you see somebody born again in their eyes, you have seen a miracle you will never forget. You can see it. Gives me chills just thinking about it. I want you to experience that. So get together with them, eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart, and show them from the Bible what the Bible actually says. And if they want to argue, let them argue with the Scriptures. Well, that's not what I was told. Okay, here's what the Bible says. But that's not what this other guy said. Okay, but this is what the Bible... Don't go down that trail with them. That's a diversion. Okay, but this is what the Bible says. But I did that when I was a kid. Okay, but this is what the Bible says. But I've been a member of the church for 40 years. Okay, but this is what the Bible says. I'm an elder in my church. Okay, but this is what the Bible says. Don't let the enemy distract them and you on this other issue. Here's the other thing to watch out for. Those who are really deceived want to argue about the definition of every word. Don't buy into that. That's just how they, that's how the enemy works. Did God really say? Eve said what God said, not exactly, but close enough. And the devil and the serpent said, eh, is that what he read? You know what he really meant was, if you eat this fruit, you become like him. Do you want to become like him? Well, I think I might. Well, then eat the fruit. Now, I just made that last part up. Go read what Genesis says. <laughs> Never trust. Never trust. This parable reveals to the church that when that day comes, a great many will not be prepared for his coming. A great many will not have the Holy Spirit, therefore they will be locked out of the wedding feast. The parable of the fig tree points out that there will come a day when Israel will become a nation and it's time for God to come back. And that generation, whatever the fig tree represents, will not depart planet earth until that is fulfilled. But you don't know when that's going to be. That's the point of that parable. The parable of the talents, although it's money in the parable, when you read it, please read it as talents like we use the word more often. Those God-given abilities that everybody gets at birth, that once you're converted are now converted to be used in the work of the kingdom of God. 
I'll give you an example. I don't think you fully appreciate how talented a certain group of our church really are. Have you ever thought how much money they could make in the world if they had not dedicated their abilities to God? Think of the most popular singer you know. How much money could he or she make in the world compared to what they make in the church? Sometimes I'm asked, why do you do what you do? Because I have the greatest boss on the planet. Is the pay good? Benefits. <laughs> Let's talk benefits. There you sit. The two servants, the evil people, reveals to us that while we're here, evil will seem to prevail. The evil in our planet seem to be winning. It appears that they're winning everything. Wealth, possessions, they have it all. That parable is saying, don't worry about it. When God brings his judgment to planet Earth, what are they going to offer from all of their gold for what we sang about earlier? You may say to that person, well, that's okay, but in my new home, streets are paved with gold. Are you ready? Or are you hoping you're ready? There's a difference. If you're not, get ready. On your way home today may be the day and hour that Jesus decides to take you. Maybe just you. Maybe the entire church. If you're traveling with somebody, I want you all to go. Don't be the one in panic left behind, especially if you're the passenger and not the driver. <laughs> All you drivers, get ready. Now, Dwayne's going to come up here and sing a closing song. While some of us are singing, some of you need to be praying. Amen?